Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Today I got a video talking about DC electronics, and I think we're gonna make some people really mad. So I had a series of comments on my video about my issues pertaining to scale trains quality. And they kind of stated that if you're just buying DC units, you're not going to be running into these problems. And I had a back and forth with these guys, and I think it was all in good faith. But I don't know that most people understand how modern DC electronics are functioning and how they're getting voltage control. And so I'm going to delve into that a little deeper. But I also kind of want to ask the question, is it time to give up on DC locomotives? And I personally don't have a problem with them, but I think it might be holding back the hobby and it's time to maybe let them go. So before we have the hard conversation of, is it time to let DC units go? Let's address the comments that I got on that video. And they stated that I wouldn't be having a lot of these problems like board failures or what have you, if these motors weren't uh, being controlled by DCC electronics. And for anybody who doesn't know, DCC is kind of like CAN bus. It just runs at a different voltage than, say, an uh, automobile, which is like two and a half volts, or tractors that I work on, which function generally sometimes in the two and a half to five volt range, depending on what it's on. These function at about 12 volts or whatever output voltage you're setting your command station to work at. And it acts kind of like AC voltage. They're constantly swapping back and forth. And that refresh rate is actually the binary signal being sent back and forth on those opposing channels. And it's not necessarily that voltage that your motor sees. So your decoder is actually first in line. It picks up the voltage from your wheel sets, which comes from the rail, which comes from your wiring, which comes from the command station. And so there's lots of things in between where you can have issues, but the decoder gets that voltage, it interprets that signal, and then sends, at least to the best of my knowledge, a pulse width modulated voltage to your motor. Now, I believe this is the case because you can actually jump inside the lock programmer and you can adjust the refresh rate of how fast those pulses go to your motor. And in doing so, you can actually change the average voltage that the motor is seeing. So it could be pulsing 12 volts at a refresh rate of 50%, and you're only seeing that voltage half of the time, so it's kind of like six volts. And that's generally how this stuff functions to the best of my knowledge. So, the, the thing then becomes, well, if you're just using a standard old controller, you're just adjusting the voltage. These pulses aren't actually hitting your motor on a DC unit. And yes and no, that is kind of true. For some older stuff, you're going to see what they would call a, um, uh, I'll leave the term off the top of my head, but it's, it's essentially a transformer that takes AC voltage, transforms it down through rectification, into a direct current and then you're using a potentiometer or say like a bariac i'm not totally sure how they were put together to adjust the voltage going to the motor and that could either use resistance or some other things but um, modern electronics just aren't that way most of the stuff is mosfet controlled so I'm going to make a bit of a leap here and say that most people anymore are not using those old brick transformers like I had when I was growing up to run my HO units to run modern stuff. If you're a beginner or someone in the budget realm and you're running DC locomotives because you're in a budget realm, and I do understand that there are some older layouts that have run very extensive stuff on DC, more than likely you're probably using something similar to this. And so a couple of things need to be taken into account. More than likely, you're using a wall wart to power this. This is what they come with. Uh, and what that is, is you're taking AC voltage, you are transforming it, you're using a bridge rectifier, and then some sort of, I assume, MOSFET control to average the power that is coming out of that. So currently, this isn't hooked up to that. I actually have all of my secondary power for my layout coming from a modified PC power supply. 
And PC power supplies, although not the cleanest, um, ask any ham radio guy about getting clean 12 volt power and how you want to do that. Uh, PC power supplies are actually pretty clean. Uh, you need decently clean power going to a lot of your components on, on a motherboard. So in most cases, this is pretty good. So what I got here is an oscilloscope. And by no means is this a good oscilloscope. This is kind of just my cheapo. If I accidentally hook something up and smoke it um, at work, because sometimes I'm dealing with electronics that have failed and I'm trying to fix. So it's always good to have a cheapo burner up front. I am currently hooked up to my PC power supply, and right there is a relatively clean line. There's a little bit of fluctuation, which I'm just not going to pick up on camera due to just the way the refresh rate works with this, but it's actually a pretty clean, pretty clean source. So now I've got uh, my, my Kato controller hooked up to my oscilloscope, and my hypothesis is that when you send voltage or a signal to a decoder, it then takes your AC voltage, picks a side to be its power because you're technically positive on both sides, and then depending on direction, uses that as its you know, directional power source. This, however, is going to do exactly the same thing you are going to change physically which direction is your power source, and then you are going to send pulses of power to the motor to vary the voltage control. Now, back EMF is going to change this on decoders. It's going to try to bump the engine with a little more power to get it to move, which is what I was running into. As those motors started to fail, it required more and more of an initial bump to get the engine moving, which to me means probably and these are cordless motors so the stator to the brush is is probably getting a bad spot in it hard to say i haven't tore one apart or done any probing i'm just assuming that's what's going on because they're cordless motors but when i turn up the voltage on this you're going to see a back and forth reading on this and that is the pulses going out from your encoder and your mosfets in this board to vary the voltage going to this unit. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go ahead and just start to turn this up. And there you go. I'm now having little voltage spikes. And the average of those differences is what the average output going to that motor is. So as I turn this up, you'll see that the period and length of those pulses changes. And technically the refresh rate stays about the same. And we'll just continue to turn that up and you see Every time the period gets a little bit longer and a little bit longer to the point where it's on almost all the time. And that shrinks into just a solid line at one point, And that is a continuous output of voltage. And then as you back it back off, it varies the amount of time that's on to the point where it's not on at all. So what did that little presentation have anything to do with whether or not we should let DC engines go? Well, first, I kind of just wanted to prove my point that I think most people are sending the same type of voltage to their motors, whether they're running DC or DCC. So there's not a whole lot of difference on the voltage control methods for either of these systems. So when you're seeing motors fail to the point where they're burning up decoders or just not functioning, that is a quality control concern that the manufacturers need to suss out and give us better products, right? These are cordless motors. Whether or not they're getting back EMF from a DCC unit or just a bigger voltage spike from a controller, it should be smooth operation all the way through. And since they're cordless, that means brushes to stator could be dead spots, could be bad brushes, not really sure. But either way, better quality is what we need to see from these manufacturers. And when it comes down to quality, it means saving money. These manufacturers are trying to save money to give us the best products they can so they can offer it to us for the cheapest price. And extra engineering, in my opinion, is going into making these models work on DC, have an easy to change DCC controller area, whether that means a plug or a drop-in board, so like DCC ready, and then having the ability to run these on premium decoders with sound installed. So for example, these new Atlas units that have the, the mono frame that's split top to bottom instead of side to side, 
they have a control board on top that is relatively complex. And you have to take out a dummy plug to get it from DC over to DCC when you install your next 24 whatever controller you want to use. So whatever decoder, excuse me. That complexity wouldn't necessarily be required if you weren't trying to run it with a DC system. You've got a speaker that needs to be isolated that's pre-installed on the board to make running sound easy, which is awesome. I'd love to have that. Lots of resistors and diodes to make sure your LEDs are directional, that type of stuff. Many of these things would not be required if that was only a DCC controlled board. The voltage going into the board would get sent directly to your DCC decoder, at which point it would only output what it's capable of outputting. So you wouldn't need to isolate the speaker. You wouldn't need to isolate any of the lights because it's a point-to-point -point connection at that point. If the decoder isn't sending out sound information, it doesn't matter if it's connected. If it's not sending out light information, information it doesn't matter because it's physically disconnected. So I think there is money to be saved at a manufacturer level by simply having DCC-only locomotives. Most DCC decoders, if not all at this point in time, allow you to run on DC. So my idea is to just get rid of DC locomotives altogether, have a DCC board installed, a cheap one on the budget end, because if you're buying lower tier locomotives, so just DCC, you don't need any of the fancy fancy stuff that say a lock sound would have. Cheap decoder, good back EMF settings, and the ability to run on DC, and that's everything you're going to want an affordable engine to do, as well as some basic lighting control. When you jump into a lock sound unit and be like Atlas currently is and give a really good price to performance difference in those pricing, and you're going to be pushing most people to sound anyway, which is where I think the industry is going. So the other side of that is the DCC ready locomotives from Cato, where it's a complete board replacement instead of a you know, direct connection point. You're relying on outside manufacturers to support your product. And the only thing about Cato that makes that usable is it's ubiquitous. A lot of locomotives are built to that standard. And since there's a lot of stuff out, there's a lot of replacement boards that go in there. The DC boards that are on a Cato are very simple. And they are cheap to produce. But at a manufacturer level, at Cato's level, where they're making thousands, if not tens of thousands of locomotives per run, there'd be very little cost difference in installing a DCC board from the factory. So talk to NCC, uh, NCE, do some bulk stuff, maybe ESUs. I think ESUs are actually providing very affordable decoders uh, to manufacturers because they sell them to us for very affordable prices. So I got to think at the manufacturing level, it's very affordable. Just at the factory, install a lock pilot board or a cheap NCE board or a Digitrax board, whatever you choose that has DC capabilities, maybe increase the price of the engines $10. And the next thing you know, you have a very capable unit that functions on DC for the beginner. And should they ever have to make the jump to DCC to do, say, more advanced lighting controls, it's already there for them. So that's less cost involved in the transition to DCC for a slightly more expensive initial cost. So say a Cato unit can be bought anywhere from $85 to $90 these days for say like an SD70. Remove that board, I think an NCE is in the range of $25 to $30. Very capable, not as good as some other boards, but could do all the basic functions you need it to do. Or if ESU came out with a lock pilot that directly slotted into a Cato, the other ones they have are about $30. That would be an excellent option. I would assume you're going to get that for about half the price at the distributor level. You don't have markups, that type of thing. That's a $15 difference in the price of the unit. So you could be selling those Kato's potentially for $100, $105 with DC just installed. There's no other option short of maybe putting sound in there, which Cato needs to get their head pulled out of their ass and get their prices down on their lock sound units. The price they're asking for those is ridiculous. But the, the price to performance thing you're looking at there, that's a drastic difference in the value that the customer's getting. So it is my 
heartfelt opinion that it is time to give up on DC locomotives and just push everything into the more advanced DCC systems. Um, and then hopefully in the near future, we get something that's even better than DCC. I know, uh, oh, I lost it. The Blue Nami decoders, they're trying to do connection through Bluetooth, which is neat, but multiple engine control could be difficult at best. We have issues with DCC. I will be the first to admit that power connection issues make a bunch of problems for controlling a locomotive. If you don't have a really good connection, your control inputs that you're putting in through DCC can't be communicated. And that does make it difficult to have a really robust system. So maybe we're looking at potentially working into say a Wi-Fi system or something that isn't at all, you know, thought of yet. You know, we're just powering through this, you know, so. It could be DC. It wouldn't need to be DCC anymore. You're just putting 12 volts or whatever output voltage you need on the rails just to provide power to the units. And then they're picking up all their signals from Wi-Fi, which you could then, you could do so much more stuff across Wi-Fi. Consisting, it could be just a complete computer interface where you physically put the engines in their position, direction, um, and lighting controls are completely based off of how that looks on on your monitor and then that could be done off of a tablet and then once consists are put together it could be controlled with an existing uh can, you know command station or what have you uh, lots of stuff could change in the future that could make this a whole lot more user friendly uh, especially when it comes to adjusting things like just the process it goes to set up an engine to get lighting situation set up properly either changing cvs or going through jmri or a lock programmer to set up all your conditions is time consuming if you could just pick and choose the engines you wanted in your consist put them in the proper position and choose i want switcher lighting and it's just done that would be awesome i'm just pushing for steps forward in the industry because i want to make this one less time consuming and more fun for the consumer or the hobbyist myself, or probably an enthusiast at this point. Uh, but easier is always better, and it brings more people into the hobby. And I think letting go of DC, although super easy, may in fact help push the hobby a little bit farther forward at a more affordable price point for the everyday person. So thanks everybody for stopping by. Again, just berate me in the comments. I would appreciate it. Bye now.